Hey guys, big show coming up. DJ Vasilievich is in. He gives us his pitch for Paris and we preview every game of round 18. It is going to be huge. And we also talked to John Casey and he's still banging on about Ben Simmons playing for Australia. Tell him he's dreaming. <laughs> Love it. Let's go. This is the basketball show with Shane the Hammer Heel. What they gonna say next? What's happening, everybody? This is the basketball show. All thanks to Code Sports, Boost Mobile, and the Throwback Store. Joe and Hammer back with you as we are every week. Hammer, what a week in hoop! Some of these results have been insane. It certainly was. And the first insane result was Southeast Melbourne. Talk about the underdogs. Probably the biggest underdogs we've seen for the entire year, Jojo. But uh, the Illawarra Hawks, I'm going to put my hand up. I was wrong. I've written them off, but they had two massive wins. So uh, we'll see what they do this week. We will get into that and more. DJ Vasilievich, John Casey is on. And we're talking Ben Simmons, of course, one of your favourite topics. Let's get to it. All right, let's get into our starting five, Hammer. We're talking NBA first. Last week, I know we talked about some of the big scores. Joel Embiid with the 70 piece. I think Kat had 62 as well. Since then, Luca's gone and dropped 73. Devin Booker had another 62 piece. There's been a lot of talk about the fact that the NBA, the way that it's played now, the way that it's officiated is very much in favor of the offense. A lot of it, it's rubbed a few people up the wrong way where where do you sit on the debate do you think that it's fair the way it is at the moment or would you prefer sort of what we had in the past well i think it's somewhere in the middle i think you know back in the 80s and 90s it was too much in favor of the defense there was hand checking you could literally grab people had two hands on the ball carrier you know if michael jordan and kobe were playing in this era the, the numbers that they would be putting in would be unbelievable um the other thing to consider too is that there's just not many offenses run you know back pre the 2000s you'd run a lot of sets so you'd bring the ball down after a score and you you would work the ball around now players just come down and they're just going straight into a pick and roll trying to score straight away so they're not using the shot clock um but let's acknowledge that some of these players are superstars booker is, was able to do it on not a lot of shots, doing it at a huge uh, percentage, and so was Lucas. So they are special players at the same time. Yeah, definitely agree with you there. Uh, closer to home, you told me last week that the Hawks, their season is done, that they're cooked. They then went and beat the Wildcats in Perth, came from behind against the Breakers at home, and are now looking you know, pretty confident heading into the next few weeks. They've got five games left. What do you say to that? I was I was surprised. I was wrong of where they were at. Those last two games that they did lose at home, especially Gary Clark, he looked a bit cooked. Didn't play a lot in that last game, was limping towards the end of that game. Um, but they were huge wins. Total respect for them being able to go over to Perth and be able to knock them off and, and beat a team that had momentum, they had confidence and all the rest of it. And then another big win coming from behind against New Zealand. But it's th there's still question marks a bit, uh, with them. They've still got to play at Sydney versus Perth, at Melbourne, uh, and also New Zealand as well. So still some, some testing times for them. All right, Hammer, let's talk about the Taipan. Sam Wardenberg extending his contract for another season. I feel like that's just... Great news for the Taipans, given they're such a small market, knowing that they've got players who want to stick around and want to be involved in the club. And, and it's wonderful for him. He's a, he's a developing talent. Yeah, you're right. It, it's great news for both parties. And, uh, you know, he, he's not a superstar in the NBL, but he's a really good player. Um, and, and I think he's only going to continue to get better. He's, he's sort of part of that foundation that Forty's being able to try and build with up there. We know that uh, Bull Quall signed uh, last year to stay when he had offers to go to other places. And it's nothing better than as a player that even though you're contracted, your club comes to you and say, we love what you're doing. You're a big part of what we're doing. We want to extend your contract. So whilst it's great for Cairns, this is good for him as well, knowing that he's got a home that he can really perform in. 
The Damien Martins number 53 jersey hammer is being retired on Sunday. Obviously, it's been reported for, for quite a while now. There were those beautiful scenes when he was surprised at, about the news over there in Perth. But just really awesome to be able to acknowledge him again and everything that he's done in the game, a six-time NBL champion. What stands out for you when you think of, of Damien Martin and the number 53 jersey? Well, he's the greatest defender we've ever seen. There's no doubt about that. Um, he brought success to the Perth Wildcats and, and doing it a different way than some of the other players that have had their numbers uh, retired. They're all big scorers, flashy type players, but Damo is that hard-nosed guy, but still really lovable and likable, just the most genuine guy away from the court. Um, he's shown he's probably one of the, the greatest leaders that we've seen at the same time. And I think his combination with Bryce Cotton was fantastic. So very well deserved and uh, it's certainly one of the, the, the fan favourites over there in the West. Yeah, it'll be an awesome occasion uh, on Sunday. They're up against the Breakers as well. So big game. Uh, Steph Talbot back for the Lightning after a year on the sidelines. 14 and 7. Thank you very much as well. Great to see her back. Obviously, not too many games left for, for the Lightning. Their season is done, but it's a big year for the Opals. If she's fit, is she a shoe in for Paris? Oh, she's a starter. You know, you only you don't have to think back their last major campaign here in, in Sydney. Um, she was outstanding. She scored the ball. She's a great defender. She's a good leader. No fuss about it. She just be able to get it done. So uh, great to see her back. It's going to take her a little bit of time um, and it probably won't help Adelaide or probably their season's done. But um, it's all about her getting herself ready for the green and gold. Five. Missed opportunity there. And from close oh, range, that's a spectacular yeah. finish from Silent Cheetah. And it's Big Z kicking off our Boost Mobile Hoops highlight. Four. Limited their points in the paint. Milwaukee just six points in the paint. That, that really helped. How about that? The veteran DeAndre Jordan over the Greek freak Giannis Antetokounmpo. Three. He's length in trouble, Adams. And there he is at the other end. I mean, that's a dunk contest dunk in a game. I love the energy that Toppin has brought to the game. But maybe it is an all-star dunk contest kind of deal. One to 20. We've got bats flying around. we got Pop Kirsten oh. in the microphone. Anthony Edwards dropped out of the ceiling. Unbelievable. He gets up right. Those are your hoops highlights, all thanks to Boost Mobile. All right, time for Points Made. John Casey is with us again this week. Case, great to have you on the show as always. We're talking NBA to begin with. Ben Simmons back on court with the Nets. Two rebounds shy of a triple-double as well. Put it in the basket of things that you absolutely love to see. What did you guys make of it and and what do you feel this means moving forward for him? Oh, great to be with you, Joe and Hammer. That was outstanding. I don't think I've been more excited to see Ben Simmons play in my life. And the athleticism, the steps that he showed were just outstanding. As you mentioned, his numbers were fantastic. He did it in just 19 minutes. And what he can bring to the table for the Boomers in Paris, to me, he's a lock. If he's fit and he wants to be there, he's a lock because he brings so much that we don't have and he is elite. Let's not ever forget that. If he gets back to his best, and we know his best is best in the world type category, then uh, we've got a lot to look forward to. But I was so excited to see him back on the floor. And to do that in his first game back after missing three months and 39 games is outstanding. Yeah, well, I don't disagree with any of that case. I mean, I, I don't think anyone's surprised that he can put up numbers like he did and do it in that sort of fashion. And, and he hasn't played for a long time. He's been working out. Um, we know that he can defend. We know that he can help the boomers. The question I've got is that, can he continue to do it? And this is what we haven't seen over the last three years. Can he stay healthy, both physically and mentally? Does he keep the passion to do what he did the other day 
in three months' time, in four months' time, when, it, when it's a grind at the end of the season? And then does he want to be able to – does he have the passion to come and play for the Boomers, give up his off-season and be part of something where it's not the NBA? It's totally different. And we haven't seen that. So you still believe that Ben Simmons wants to play for Australia and will play for Australia? I do. I think he's changed his mindset toward that. And I think Brian Gorgian should take a lot of credit for that because he included Ben Simmons in Tokyo as much as he could, even though Ben wasn't even in Japan. And he even did so after they won the medal, made a point of ringing him and saying that, you know, he wanted him to share in it and he wanted him to be part of the next games moving forward. So I think that mindset has permeated Ben Simmons. He knows that being with the Boomers is going to be good for him. He's in the prime of his career, 27 years of age, and I think he's ready to go. I think he does want to play, but of course, uh, all the points you make were very uh, fluid as well, and I think that uh, we're going to find out uh, in the next little bit exactly whether he plays or not. Well, I hope Fingers- you're right, Case. Exactly. Fingers crossed from that point of view. Uh, closer to home in the NBL, the foul count, guys. It's up 7% on last year. I want to get your thoughts why is it happening happening and do you think it's a problem Joe, I think it could be the biggest problem the NBL is facing at the moment. As you mentioned, the fouls this season are up 7%. We're going to have a record number of players foul out in the 10-team era this season, and it's even up 13% on two years ago. Now, it's not as high as it was, say, 10 years ago, but the foul count is a problem, and we're seeing teams, Adelaide and Brisbane, both took top 10 franchise record free throws in a game recently. People are getting bored with people taking free throws. There's too many fouls. And people are even complaining about fouls not being called. There was the Aaron Baines moving screen that took out Ian Clark. And there was a travel violation on Denzel Valentine in the Sydney Kings game on the weekend that was missed. He moved three metres without dribbling the ball and it wasn't called. So I think there are fouls that are being missed, but there are too many fouls being called. Suggestions of going to six fouls, I'm not a fan of that. I really don't know how you solve this problem. Now, Justin Nelson, who's an astute basketball executive in New Zealand and previously before that in Australia, is talking about that the player's athletic ability and development has gone ahead of where the referees are. And I think there's some merit in that conversation that it's tough. I've tried to referee a basketball game. It's impossibly tough. And I think the referees, I'm not sure how they solved this problem, but it's a massive problem with too many players fouling out of games and too many free throws being taken. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one, Case. We, we want scoring. The fans want scoring. There's no doubt about that. But we, we need to be able to clear up the fouls that have no impact. They're the ones that we need to be able to do. And then we need some of the players to be able to be smart as well. There's so many fouls where you look at it and say, mate, what are you thinking? You can't put your hand in there. You can't foul in that situation. But what's your take on John really then saying that not enough fouls have been called for Bryce Cotton, Case? Yeah, I meant to mention that, Hammer. I was astounded, and I'm astounded the NBL hasn't asked John Rudy for a please explain as well. I mean, he has been critical of the referees there, and other coaches have gone into a post-match press conference and brought that up and been asked to explain their comments. So I understand where he's coming from. Bryce Cotton, I think, doesn't get as many calls as he should because he is fantastic, Bryce Cotton. He plays through contact. He doesn't milk fouls. A lot of people suggest he kicks his legs out. That's his shooting action. But if he's bumped making a cut, he doesn't complain about it. If he's bumped making a layup, he just gets on with the job and he makes the adjustments. I don't think they call enough fouls that are there on Bryce Cotton. He's just so good. He plays through it and is still able to make a shot. So I think John Rilly's comments have merit, but the way that they were conducted, it seems that there's double standards there in terms of some coaches can say something and get away with it. Other coaches say something and they're hauled before a tribunal or asked them for a please explain letter. Well, I would have thought that uh, what John really said was worse than what Adam Ford said when he was being sarcastic about the referees. So I totally agree with you. Mm, interesting one. Uh, guys, Chris Golding, his streak of hitting three three-pointers in a game has ended at 15. It's the longest run in the NBL. Wait for it. This is Brian Gorgian in 1984. <laughs> That is a pretty impressive record. I'll put my hand up. I did not realise that Gorge could shoot the ball that well if we're talking about him and Chris Golding in the same conversation. 
Uh, that's a good point, Joe. Joe uh, Gorch didn't mind jacking them up. He played one season with the Melbourne Tigers, an average 10 a game, but he could shoot it. And he also made plenty of assists as well. I think his career high was 19 assists in a game. So, But Gorge, yeah, he hit three plus in 15 games. And that's when I looked at the numbers for Chris Golding and thought 15 in a row is pretty special. And I couldn't find one going way back to 1984. I couldn't find an NBA player this season who has hit three plus in 15 games in a row. It is phenomenal what Chris Golding has been able to do. And that's why he's in career best form. You have to say he's going to be in that all NBL team because people underestimate Chris Golding. And look, he is, he is a supreme NBL player and one of the best shooters we've ever seen. I don't think Hammer ever even got 15 games in a row with three plus, but he did get into double figures, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, I want to talk about Gorge. How dare you, Jojo, not know the history of Brian Gorge. I know. <laughs> now, he, he wasn't in the defensive conversation. There's no doubt about that. But uh, he could certainly shoot it. Uh, but Chris Golding, he has. He's, he's been incredible. And I, I credit also Dean Vickerman this year for the what he's been able to help Chris Golding with. I was critical over a couple of years ago where I didn't think Dean Vickerman ran enough stuff for Chris Golding, knowing how potent he is and how tough the shots are that he makes, how much defensive attention that he creates where he's become a good passer and he gets other people into the game as well. So I think some of the sets that they're running have been really clever. You sort of have to replay it to see exactly what they've done. Uh, but Chris Golding hits the most unorthodox uh, shots. He hits them in transition. He hits them in people's face. He's stepped back. He's got range. He's got the lot. So he's, uh, he's playing as good a basketball as we've ever seen. No doubt. There was one three he hit towards the end of that game against the Kings that had everybody in the arena on edge for a moment. Because you know as soon as he gets hot, that game, that game is Melbourne United's to take. But the Kings managed to, to hold on in that one. Uh, Case, love your work as always. Great to chat uh, and we'll see you here in a couple of weeks again. Look forward to it. Great finals run coming up. Really excited about the Adelaide 36ers maybe getting a push into the top six. So fingers crossed. See you soon. Jeez, he just couldn't let it go without the Adelaide push, could he? But good on you, Case. <laughs> love it. All right, we have a special guest this week, Adelaide 36's sharpshooter, DJ Vasiljevic. Uh, DJ, so good to have you on the show. First of all, congrats on the new contract, really well deserved. Can you talk through that process and how those conversations went with the club? I uh, appreciate you guys having me on. No, the, the thing went, everyone went pretty smooth, honestly. I didn't have representation at the start, so they were just trying to do it with myself and I'm not an agent, I'm just a player, so... I had to kind of figure out who my next agent would be. And then when I signed with Michael and Marquis, it kind of went all smooth sailing from there and got it done pretty much in like a day or two. So the offer they presented was pretty good and you can't say no to that. And obviously I'm being happy here. So it's a win-win for me. Yeah, you do look happy, mate. You're playing some great basketball. You've really helped Adelaide uh, become competitive again and get some wins. Well, what is it that makes you happy? And what are you looking for in an environment to be able to have this extension? Yeah, I think it's just being wanted. Um, I've never felt wanted before, like I have here in Adelaide. The fans love me, the coaches love me, the front officers welcome me with open arms and they're just letting me be me. Obviously, when I was at the Sydney Kings, everyone's known me as a, as a shooter and I kind of was needed in my role. And now here I'm wanted. Everyone gets to see a bit of who I actually am, scoring, playmaking, just being myself that I've been as a junior growing up. So yeah, I'm happy to, to be here for the next three years and hopefully try and compete for another championship. Do you feel like you're playing more of a leadership role with Adelaide? I think that's what it, it seems like from the outside looking in. But do you feel that internally as well? Yeah, 100%. I think I've always wanted to be that guy, obviously the first or second option. And I kind of, Scotty and, and the front officer said, yep, you can do that. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to play the best basketball. We're winning games and everyone's happy. So that's the main thing. If we can get wins and everyone stays happy, that's all I ever want. CJ Bruton is a legend in our game and uh, one of the real good guys in the NBL as well. So no one wants to say anything bad about CJ. But what has Scotty Ninnis done that's been different, that's really enabled the team to have this success? Yeah, obviously CJ is, was a great player and we always have to separate the personal from the business side. And obviously the 36 has made a business decision to let him go. And ever since Scotty's taken over, he's simplified everything. We have three or four offenses. You know, we have certain plays for certain guys and... 
he's pretty much just kept it simple. He's told us, you know, how he wants us to de- defend. He wants to play a more higher up-tempo game, which we've done really well in the past few games. And yeah, that's really it. Just everything so simple, win or lose. You know, everyone's chilling out after the game, having a nice little, little beer or wine to, to hang out. And it's just more of a culture thing now. Um, he wants everyone to keep bonding together off the court, even though we're, we're second last right now. But yeah, he's kept everything simple and kept that culture uh, intact. DJ, it was well documented that you had some preconceived sort of ideas of the 36ers before you got there. You've been there for a while now. You obviously like it. That That's all obvious. But what were those things that sort of surprised you about the club that you perhaps didn't realise before you got there? Yeah, everyone keeps their receipts. So that's why I deleted Twitter and I haven't said anything negative about anyone uh, ever since. But no, nah, obviously it was just they weren't winning as much as you know they wanted and I've kind of brought that in and honestly everyone's been amazing in the front office the ownership the fans have been great you know i take pretty much everything back what i've said because they welcome me with open arms and honestly it's a great place to be the, the lifestyle here just everything like you know I, I regret what i said but again i said it because based off what i was seeing from the outside now you were saying off air that there's still some belief that you can make the play in or playoffs um It'd be nice to be able to uh, start that against the Kings and uh, maybe pull them back a little bit as well. Yeah, honestly, this this whole NBL season has been a roller coaster. Obviously, everyone's just switching from third to fourth, you know, from ninth to seventh. Like, it's probably the most competitive season um, I've seen in a long time. And that, that makes it a good thing with the play-in now. You know, if we can rally off the next four games and a couple of teams, you know, lose and, you know, help us out, we can make that play-in spot. And, you know, everyone wants to start this little little fire of me and the Kings, and but who wouldn't mind a little, you know, Adelaide versus Kings in our first game in the play-in? We would love that. <laughs> how, do, how do you pro, uh, appro- approach this game uh, on the court? Obviously, there's the personal side of things, but from a, a, a match-up point of view, how do you guys win this? Honestly, you got to start with Jalen Adams and obviously he's the head of the snake. And if we can somehow contain him and, you know, I think Sunday Detch and Nick Marshall have been terrific for us on the defensive end. Obviously, I think Trey Kell will get a go at him. So I think everybody, if we can stop him, it kind of stops him from playmaking and getting downhill and whatnot. And obviously they've got Denzel and, you know, I think Jordy and, and Glove have started to play some great basketball the last few weeks. So it'll be, it's pretty much like a one-on-one matchup. You know, I don't really... They have like a delay action that they run and then it turns into a kind of one-on-one basketball. So it's really guarding your man one-on-one. Mate, I want to talk to you about the NBA. You got close, you're over there. You've shown that uh, you're that caliber of player and probably just need the right opportunities. Where's that sit now? And and do you have NBA outs? And uh, are you still ready to have another crack at that level? Yeah, obviously things didn't go the way I wanted to when I was over there, but you realize the NBA is a business. Um, obviously with Washington, they aren't performing. So, you know, good on them for, you know, I always say karma, karma comes back to bite people in the butt. And obviously they're not performing the way they need to. So honestly, I do still have NBA ambitions, but it's not my number one priority. If I do get the chance in the right spot to go, I'll go because I do have an NBA out. But right now I've signed this extension and I want to compete for a championship. Big year for the Boomers as well, DJ. Let's say Gorge gets on the phone with you tomorrow and says, right, give me your pitch. What are you bringing to this team if I take you to Paris? What are you saying? Yeah, obviously, you got to keep in mind playing for the Boomers and playing in the NBL, you got to play two different roles. And I think the one thing they were missing quite a lot was shooting. Um, obviously, we have great athletes and whatnot and people who can create, but I don't feel like we held that guy. We didn't have the person, the person to make wide open threes. Obviously, we had Chris Goulding, but he didn't play much. So... If I can just continue to defend, rebound, and, and make open shots when I, if I get the chance to go, like that's my pitch, really. There's nothing else. I'm not expected to play 30 minutes, have the ball in my hand. You know, I'll give you 10, 15 minutes uh, on the offensive end, on the defensive end, and again, we all compete for one thing, and that's a gold medal. So, I think just the shooting and, and uh, being able to defend will be the, my biggest pitch. A huge round 18 coming up, Hammer. We're going to preview the six games because every single one of them will have an impact on the ladder positionings. Uh, it starts Thursday night, the Taipans and Jack Jumpers. Who have you got in this one? It's in far north Queensland. Well, this is another game that's a flip of the coin. Third versus seventh, but there's only one win between them. Absolutely unbelievable stuff. So both teams are going to be desperate. 
uh, to for Cairns particularly to get into that top six or top four and for uh, Tassie to, to consolidate. And I'm going to go for Tassie. I just think they're more consistent. They're more reliable. I think Doyle's starting to play some good basketball. I think Magne's starting to play more minutes and he can have a, a really big impact in this game. So I'm going for Tassie. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I've gone for the Taipans just because it is a really difficult place to play. Uh, I'm not overly confident in that, though. Uh, Friday night, the 36ers take on the Kings. We've spoken to DJ Vasiljevic already. We know he wants to get the win over his former team. Who wins that one? Knowing the 36ers have already beaten them uh, in January uh, in Adelaide. Well, I I think we know what we can expect from the Adelaide 36ers. Um, They're they're playing great basketball. They're playing very much together. Their roles are now sorted out. Trey Kell's playing extremely good basketball. We know DJ's been able to put some points on the board and they're happy. That's a good thing. We can't say that for the Sydney Kings. They've probably been the most inconsistent team in, in the entire competition. They've got the talent. They've got the talent to go for a three-peat. The, this team was put together to win the championship, but they don't look happy. They're inconsistent. They have a bad loss one day. Then they come back, have a really big win against Melbourne United, who looked flat to me. So I'm going to go for Adelaide. I think that they can create another upset here. Yeah, okay. I think it's going to be a great game. I definitely have the Kings in this one. I think it's too important a time for them. I think they'll be able to... Uh, make something happen down there in Adelaide, but we'll, we will see. This one I have absolutely no idea about. The Hawks hosting the Bullets Saturday afternoon. Cannot cannot tell you which way this goes. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard because I think over the two weeks we've seen the best of the Illawarra Hawks. And then I thought two weeks ago when they lost two at home, they didn't look that same team. So they've been able to bounce back. Whatever Justin Tatum's done, has been really good for them. And I think they can win this again. I agree with you. It's a close game because I like what Brisbane are doing. They're a better defensive team. They're really well drilled. They're tough. They've got size. Um, But I think the Illawarra Hawks can just put a, a few more points on the board and get over the line for this one. The final throwdown of the season happens Saturday evening as well. Melbourne United taking on South East Melbourne. United have kind of gone win, loss, win, loss, win, loss. They're on track for another win, and I think they get it here. They will win by 15 to 20 plus, Joe. They were disappointing in that game against Melbourne. They'll be disappointed. But, you know, when your superstars shoot at such a poor percentage, and, and they did with with, with Golding and, and Daly couldn't make a bucket. Um, so I think they'll bounce back. They need a big win, and they'll want to put the boots into southeast Melbourne. We know that. And they'll do it. Uh, this is a massive weekend. We've already talked about the Jack Jumpers and 36ers. They meet on Sunday, though. So second game of the round for both of those teams. A lot obviously can happen in seven days in basketball. And you get the feeling that one of those teams will be super high come Sunday. The other one will probably be a lot lower. But who do you have for that one? Well, you can't write off the 36ers on the road in this game. They've got the talent. They've shown that they can go and take some scalps on the road, but I have to go with the Jack Jumpers. They haven't been good at home this year. They ha- they need to be. This is going to be a, a, a pressure game for them. Another sold out uh, crowd down there. They're going to be very passionate. And there's big stakes on the line for them. They, you know, they're really playing for third spot. If they can get that, that's going to be a massive advantage for, for them. And, and I think they'll get it done. Does it feel like given ev- every one of these games, as we mentioned, has an impact on ladder positionings? Come the end of this round, there could be teams that have completely fallen off and there could be teams that have almost solidified themselves in that sort of play-in positioning. The Breakers are one of those. They play against the Wildcats Sunday. We talked about it earlier. Damian Martin with his jersey retirement sort of ceremony as well. A big occasion for the Wildcats. But the Breakers will be dangerous here. Oh, there's no doubt they'll be dangerous. And they've got the talent. You know, I keep talking about them having three of the the better players in the entire competition. So they've got the talent. I like the way uh, Will McDowell-White has been able to come back from injury. He's starting to have an impact as well. But you have to think that the Wildcats are going to be desperate themselves because their last home game in front of a big crowd, they poked themselves in the eye. They lost that game that they really needed to win. Then they went on the road to get a win. They have to start playing with a little bit more consistency. And uh, while I like New Zealand, I still think Perth will be too strong at home. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm with you there. In front of the Red Army, they'll get it done. They have to. 
That's all we've got time for another episode of the Basketball Show in the bag. Hammer, I can't believe it's 17, 18 shows in. It goes quickly. Yeah, it does. And we're really getting to the exciting part of the year in the NBL and uh, so many great games. My favourite this week is going to be Perth and New Zealand. The talent on show there, I think we've got either three or four of the best players in the entire league. So that's going to be a great game. I love it. Bring it on. All thanks to Code Sports Boost Mobile and the Throwback Store as always. We'll catch you guys next week. This is a co-production by News Corp Australia and Closer Sports.